<laughs> so I've been asked to talk about the Matai Restoration Project, project and its Kiwi Collie and, and how it started. So um, hence the Matai Restoration Project T-shirt, can't Kiwi on the back, but also somewhere of the Forest Bridge Trust. Um, so where's, where's Matai? So Matai is at this weird place over here called Glorit. Um, it's on two maps now. Um, I lay in bed last night and thought, no, I mustn't, I mustn't get sidetracked, but I will get sidetracked. It was, it was, Glorit was named after my great-great-grandfather who, who loved a piece of land in Scotland, and when he wanted a piece of land of his own, he wanted to call it, call it Glorit. So they bought the whole of the Matai um, block, as it was known in those days in, in 1863, and he bought the whole of the Matai block and he called it Glorit. But when the farm was split in, in um, 1891 between my, my great-grandfather and his brother, our part of the farm retained its name Mattia, and it's, so that's why it's known as Mattia. I'm not going to sidetrack anymore. Um, so, so the red line, oh, somewhere, yeah, that one there. So the red line around, around, that you can see around there is, the, is Mattia, and it's 1,300 hectares. And as you can see, Atuanui is 500 metres from our northern boundary. So it's really just a, a wee, a short walk. And I must, I must point out Kew Haven in our southern boundary. Tom and Marouk Stasek, Tom was one of the founding um, trustees of the Forest Bridge Trust as well. Tom and Marouk have got 25 hectares of re completely revegetated forest that they've converted from a dairy farm. Um, so who's involved in the restoration project? It's the Gardner family, my whanau, but it's also very much Ngāti Whātou Aikaipara who have spiritual and whānau connections to Mataya. It's also the huge number of consultants, advisors and conservationists, many of whom are here today, who have helped Kevin and I on our journey of, of learning. Most importantly though, are our volunteers, and in particular the members of Kaipra Kiwi, who are sitting here and said, I can't wait to hear you speak, but, but never mind. So um, I, I won't name them, but um, they, they're fantastic, and hopefully we'll have a few more joining us shortly. Um, but there's also the people who are involved, as Matu said, in, in, in our trapping volunteers and the, the many volunteer planters. So, so what is the Matai Restoration Project? It's 1,300 hectares of, of, of working of farm. But it incorporates, yep, thank you, it incorporates 100, sorry, 800 hectares of working farm. It also incorporates a sand washing operation, but it also incorporates a tourism business built around the Matai homestead, which you've just seen, and about the walking tracks. Sorry, <laughs> I'll go back, no, I'll go back. So I don't, I don't trust that, no, I do. <laughs> sorry. No, I'm, I'm really sorry, I didn't mean that at all. That's really rude. <laughs> but anyway, so the tourism business built around the Matai homestead and around the, the walking tracks that are part of Matai as well. So um, it also it includes in continued and intensive pest and predator control. And um, I must say that we do do intensive cat control. There's 40 Steve Allen cat traps and there's now, thanks to Transpower, who funded a Celium network of remote sensored traps. There's 10 remote sensored traps. The blue, the blue outlines are the remote sensored traps. So I just threw... What, in Cam Speedy's terms, a great big heap, or no, John Bissell's terms, a great big heap of bloody um, here and there the other day, so hopefully somebody will think that's yummy. But um, there's also a bait station network, um, and I'll talk a wee bit about that later, but also involved, as Matu said, in repairing and planting and fencing and planting. That's the shears planting of a, a gully um, on the property. So... Um, so why did we get it, get into this? Oops, I'll get, I won't, I'll hopefully not do the wrong thing at the wrong times. Okay. So Kevin and I left farming in 2003. We'd farmed for 25 years and Kevin said, if I don't leave now, my body, I won't be able to do anything with my body. So we left farming. And we spent two years volunteering in the Solomon Islands. And the experience affected us in a huge number of ways, but most significantly in conservation. Because when we flew in and out of Solomons, they... They, they were cutting down the trees, those glorious old teak trees and things that we've probably got on our, on our um, decks. And the confluence, out the confluence of the river and the sea, there were these massive fans of red soil. Just, it was just 
And it just it seemed to affect both Kevin and I. And when we came back to New Zealand, we had no idea what we were going to do. But our son-in-law, Shane Hood, who, if anybody lives in Kuiper Flats, they'll know that the name Hood is, is associated with Kuiper Flats. But Shane said to us, come up to Atunui and help with the Atunui Restoration Project, which at that stage was run by the Kuiper branch of Forest and Bird. And we stood up there, and if you've been to the, had the pleasure of being to the top of Atunui and look back, you look back right out over Matai, and we thought, mm, we're not doing anything at Matai, maybe we need to do something. And that's why we needed to do something. That was our deciduous Bahutakawa in 2007. So, um, why did it look like this? Um, as Maru said, we'd been farmers. We knew all about livestock and grass, but we didn't know much about New Zealand's flora and fauna. I'd grown up at Mataia, the bush had always been there, looking after itself with my grandmother's help. You know, she made possum skin cloaks and sent them off to, <laughs> off to, to England during the war. But unfortunately, it's no longer the case. So you may be asking yourselves, and you've every right to do so, why hadn't we done anything before this? And my right of reply for myself and for Kevin and for every other landowner in the room, be they private, Māori, council, doc, or QE2 owned. If you can't be green, sorry, you can't be green if you're in the red. And, it, and it's not just about money. So it's not just about that. Okay, it's also about time. It's also about energy. And it's also what we learned about knowledge. So it's those four things. And I think it's out of those four things that Kevin and I, the most important value for the trust is empathy, is not to blame, not to point the finger, and please, no more pictures of cows and drains, unless you know the reason why. Just so empathy, is that's what drove Kevin and I a lot, was empathy for, for landowners and what they need to do and how they do it. So um, anyway, that's enough of that. But what, um, so what changed for us? Um, all those things that Mataya incorporates, the farm, the forestry, the tourism, all contribute financially to the property. So suddenly went from being in the red financially to being in the green. By 2006, we weren't farming anymore, we'd retired, as Maru said, and we had more energy. And we also, we, um, our children had all left home, and, and those of you with children know how much energy they take up. I'm not sure how Anna does it, but she does. And we also had spare time to do and to learn. So possums were first. In 2009, the Auckland City Council, Auckland Council employed contractors to cyanide Atu Anui. And we said, woohoo, what about us? That's part of the 500 possums that were taken out of 200 hectares. So that's why those Pahutakawa and the previous one looked like that. So, um, in 2010, that's what those Bhutakawa looked like. So it was, it was, you know, an amazing transformation. So after five years of, of increasingly intensive pest control, several of our other advisors approached us and said, what great Kiwi habitat. And this is the bush that Kevin and I are very fortunate to wake up to and look at every morning. Um, but fast forward two years, and David has shared with you the journey that is translocation. We were hugely lucky to have Ngāti Manahiri, I'll, I'll read it properly here, Ngāti Manahiri um, brought Kiwi from Motuora Island to, to Mataia in May in 2013. It was a fantastic occasion. We were hugely lucky, it was just awesome. And part of that was 500 people, including children from Kuiper Fat School. And there's Liz Mayer, who was at that stage part of DOC, but who is now and was and still is a trustee of the Forest Bridge Trusts, who we're extremely lucky to have. But since that day, everybody who talks to us says, how is the Kiwi doing? And of course, Kevin and I say, fine, we hope. <laughs> but they also, the next question is, but how many are there? Oh dear, okay. So I thought I'd try and do this. I mean, everywhere I go at the moment, I go to Hui's and, and there's lots of modeling. So this is a model based on the information I know and you can go away and you can do whatever you like with it, but this is, this is what I've done. We were farmers, 
In farming, you do stock reconciliations at the end of every financial year. So we'll have a stock reconciliation of our Kiwi. So, so here they are. In 2013, the opening balance was 13. The next year, another 12, and the following year, 23. However, you need to look at the deaths, which is the ones on the other side. We didn't know. The first one we did know about, and it was like your wa'ariki. I can't, have I got his name right? Our one ended up five kilometres away, just past the, um, the road that goes up to the Kuiper Hills. He ended up in a property there. Unfortunately, a property that had dogs. We didn't know how long he'd been dead, but more than likely he'd been killed by dogs. We didn't know about the next two the following year, but the next year we did. And there's the culprit. It was a huge shock, because it was at the time when that guy, they were, they were chasing that guy in Belgium looking for, looking for the terrorist, and he was our terrorist. It took us about six weeks, but we finally got him in a live capture chat trap. It was, it was such a relief. But let's look at the positive side, and my apologies to those of you who may have seen some of these before. These, this is the positive thing, and you can see the date, it's 2014, so we, we released the birds in 2013, this was the next breeding season. That, believe it or not, is in a pine forest. So when Virginia said they love pine forest, yes, they didn't choose to nest in our beautiful bush, no, they chose to nest in a pine forest. <laughs> That's Charlie's nest there. So this one, hopefully I can get these to work for you, but here is Charlie, whoops, hopefully coming out of his nest. No, he's, is he? Oh, you might have to make it up big, actually. You'll have to make the whole screen here big. Yeah. No, it won't, it won't work. So we'll have to go. Um, we'll have to go out of the whole thing. Sorry, everybody. We're just these things are renowned for misbehaving. Oh, it's going. There he is. Okay. So here he is coming out of his nest. They nest underground, and there he's covering. He's covering the the hole mostly to disguise it so nobody will come along and see that there might be something in there, but also for temperature control. But if you can just, he's out of his nest now and we will move on because otherwise I'll get that terrible bell in a minute, which is a bit scary. Um, I'll, let, I'll trust her this time, she can do the next bit. So here he is, oh he is coming, he's already moving. It's all clear we've got it happening. So here he is coming back to his nest, you can look at the time again, 21.49. They're out for about, maybe about three, three, three and a half hours when they're nesting. You can see the transmitter on his leg on the left. You can also unfortunately see he's got a band on the right leg, and I always say that actually the females are always right, but unfortunately not in this case. The males are right, so the band is on the right leg. And this is um, what this guy does. He, um, he spends, during the breeding season, he can, he can lose up to a five, 500 grams. He's normally about two kilos, but then he's about um, at 1.5 here. This is, well, we've gone a bit fast. We won't do this one. We'll, leave, we'll stop this one for now. The last one was his wife, Taran, well, I shouldn't say that, his mate, his mate Taranaki. Taranaki, you could tell it was her because she had a white, a white band on her, on her leg. She's, she's just coming, um, presumably, to check up on him. Everybody thinks, oh, the poor old male, he's sitting there for 75 or 85 days on, on that one nest. What is she doing, just hanging about? But she, to do that, for him to be sitting there, she's laid two 300-gram eggs, so 600 grams within three weeks. So she's gone off to get to eat, to get build up her strength again, because believe it or not, in 75 days, once, once he's finished and he's, um, that egg is hatched, she will drag him off to her next nest. And there's often up to three a year. So Francis, who is the great-grandfather of some of the people in this room, is, is one of our most productive birds, as Francis was. So he had many, he's had many offspring, and one year he had four, four um, clutches of, of um, birds altogether. So anyway, moving on to the next slide, thank you. Um, so here, sorry, that's not the right. That's the, not the right one. It's the one before. Sorry, that's if we can get that one going. So yeah, that's it's going now. So I'll just leave. So often, so I, as I said, in, in mostly in the first clutch, 
they, that's not just one egg, but as you can see, coming up, coming, 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 is two. And I'll leave, I'll leave this one running. This was the first video footage we had of our Kiwi, and we were just so delighted when we got home and, and saw this. It was fantastic. But once again, do check the date. It's the 16th of September, 2014. So they're just they're gorgeous. But so we'll look at the next one, and the most important thing is to look at the date, which is the fifteenth of September two thousand and fourteen. So cats are a huge issue for us here at at Mataya. There's, there was a second cat in the same on the same nest about a week later, and my son-in-law spent a day tracking and killing it. It was a five kilogram male. So yeah, so it's a, it's a huge issue. And if anybody says to you feral cats aren't an issue, then just, just remember this photo. Okay, so um, what am I up to? Um, okay, so back to the Kiwi reconciliation. So based on, you will go to the next one, thank you, Claire. So, so based on all of the information that we know about Kiwi births and deaths, we can model the population so that by the end of 2015, we can assume that there were 37 birds, or say 15 pairs. So in 2016, why only nine chicks from 15 pairs? When I've told you the female can lay up to six eggs, but only 65% of those will survive to hatch. And that's because kiwi eggs are very um, um, porous, and they often get bacterial infections, so only 65% of the eggs will actually survive. In areas trapped for mustard lid control, and this is really depressing, but please don't go away with this message because it's not, it's not a good message, but you've probably heard it before. Survival rates for chicks in, must, in trapped areas for mustard lid control can vary from 5% to 45%. And we'll talk about that a wee bit in a minute. So I'll estimate a 20% for survival rate at this stage, which is much better than the average of 5% survival rate in untrapped areas. So 15 pairs, have three eggs at a 20% per survival rate is nine chicks, which is not very flash. In autumn 2017, Kevin and I attended a conservation hui such as this with mustard lid expert Carolyn King, who um, Hemi and Kevin and I went up there, and she gave a talk and she said to us, she said to everybody that the worst thing about stoats is they're so smart. And once they learn about traps, they tell their mates and they tell their young and they tell everybody else. So you end up with a population of untrappable stoats. And there, there is some, there is some um, intellectual data about this. There's a paper that's been written on it. But anyway, in winter 2017, we used 1080 in bait stations to target untrappable stoats and cats. And we now expected to have 15 pairs of chicks with three eggs with an expected 60% survival rate. So from going from nine chicks, we're now expecting 27 chicks to survive. By 2018, we assumed that juveniles start breeding. So now we've got 19 pairs, and I say 2019 because probably after about two or three years, the juveniles will start breeding. In populations such as at Ponui, where they're very, very high population, it may take longer, but with our population not being very big, they probably started breeding quite quickly. So we assume the juveniles start breeding, so now 19 pairs have three eggs each at, say, a 40% survival rate, so now we've got 22 chicks. So using these assumptions, and with another round of 1080 in 2020, which we did manage to do in between COVIDs, by 2022, we'd expect to have 278 kiwi at Mataya, and at the end of this year, around 300. So I'm not surprised that they're making their way out. They're probably thinking that it's getting a bit overcrowded. But there's a couple of thorny issues that we need to address when we're thinking about this modelling. Um, one adult breeding female has a huge impact on a population. Over the 60-odd years of her life, she's capable of producing 340 eggs. And at a 60% survival rate, that's 222 chicks. So one Kiwi death, one female Kiwi death, boom. So the seven up in Opua Forest, if half of those are females, that's 660 chicks that won't ever live. So adult deaths must be avoided. Chicks, yes, if we can possibly, but adult deaths, most importantly. So how do we know that we're not losing the adults that we did at the beginning? We don't. 
but we do everything possible to avoid it. We've got a very strictly enforced no dog policy at Mattia. Um, and if you're a neighbour of ours, you'll know how strictly strict that is. Some of them don't have dogs anymore. Dogs are the major, sorry. <laughs> um, um, dog, dogs are the major cause of Kiwi deaths in Northland, as I already said. We've, so we've, as I said, we've got an absolute zero tolerance for wandering dogs and wandering cats. We, we shoot first and ask questions later. And we've never had any issues with people who we have had to do that to. I think everybody understands they've known us for long enough. So we offer a Kiwi avoidance training to our neighbours with dogs. We've recently, as I said, set up a remote live capturing cat network specifically for cats and ferrets. We've got an intensive mon motion sensor monitoring camera network. And finally, after three years, our wonderful Kaitra Kiwi people have been hard at dock to get a permit to, to put transmitters back onto our Kiwi. I know David's looking forward to the day when they don't have to have transmitters on Kiwi. But unfortunately, it's still our best way of knowing if anything's absolutely, absolutely happening. Because unfortunately, Kiwi call counting is great, but it, it's too far apart. Um, but in, in just saying that, I know in David's talk, he mentioned the fact that, that rat control and possum control isn't absolutely vital to Kiwi, um, to, to Kiwi surviving. But remember, Kevin and I were farmers, and so you measured grass and ki kilos of dry matter per hectare. Some of you might know what that means. But those of you who don't, it means how much material the, the livestock have got to eat. And for us, it didn't seem worth having kiwi unless you could feed them properly. You weren't going to breed or do anything properly if you didn't feed them properly. So that meant getting rid of rats. So that's why we've got that big bait station network. And that's why we bait every year and we try to keep our population of rats down to about 5%, which is it's pretty reasonable, really. So that, that's our, the other thing that we do. But anyway, just getting on to, um, how's my time? You're going to ring a bell in a minute? Oh, right, okay. So, um, okay, so, so we call count, as Virginia said, and somewhere there's a graph coming up which shows us um, how we're doing. And as Virginia said, up above five is a high population. And Sue, who does our call count monitor, um, reading of our cards, sent me an email the other day to say that it's now six point something. So it's, it's doing, they're doing fantastically well. So whether that relates to how many we've got, if, if 6.75 relates to 300 Kiwi, I have no idea. And unfortunately, nobody can tell us either. And where am I up to? Okay, so although Matai is not a fence sanctuary, you can now see that the Kiwi have been able to leave and we're absolutely delighted that it's happening. And we could never have done this if it hadn't been for the Forest Bridge Trust who have enabled us, or not us, they've done all that. They've created this amazing, this amazing um, buffer zone around Mattia. And because I couldn't find a better place in the presentation, Kevin and I want to say a very huge special thank you to the wonderful group of people who are now the Forest Bridge Trust. And um, your commitment to the vision and the mission of the Trust has been amazing. And we just wanted to, to make make sure you, you received our thanks. And and also to the many of you out there who, have, who are contributing to the to the mission of the Trust, thank you too. Um, but um, the Trust is not just about Kiwi. And yes, as, as Anna mentioned, we were extremely fortunate to attract a huge pot of money from Save the Kiwi via the Jobs for Nature funding. And yes, our focus has been on creating Kiwi habitat, but um, as Anna said in her introduction, so many other species benefit so well. And when I knew that John was coming and he was going to be talking, I had to, I had to bring this next, I hope it's the next one, the next one after that. It's this. <laughs> <laughs> and, and hopefully if you can get it to play, if, if, you, if we can get it to play, um, these guys benefit. So there he is. Um, so we just, we just, we were delighted. That was, that was one of the, the things from Virginia's fantastic work and she's done a magnificent job and that was just one of the results of, of one of her from one of her cameras. But I finally wanted to reflect on the Kevin and I wanted to reflect on the theme of the Hui, which was an amazing thing for the 
people who dreamt it up about building a legacy. And we thought for a while that it could be something concrete like this, wherever this is, the next one. This is what you would have seen in the paper, and it was fantastic. Kaipara Kiwi are wonderful people and have done a fantastic job, and it is a fantastic legacy. However, we're much, much more than that. And just to finish on the words of David Attenborough, it is surely our responsibility to do everything within our power to create a planet that provides a home not just for us, but for all life on Earth. So let a home for all life on Earth be the legacy for us all. Thank you.